Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming for this uh, workshop on fair data. And the idea here is to present some of the results we have uh, in an Open Earth Monitor regarding our fair data efforts. And then also to, pro to try to encourage some discussion with uh, the participants and uh, get some feedback. Okay, so today we have three speakers. And that's first is going to be Juan Mazo Pao from the Center of Ecological Research and Forest Forestry Applications. And he's going to talk about FAIR in general. And, and this is not the exact title, but it's more or less the topic. Um, and then I will speak about our results that we, we did some surveys and interviews. And then Cathy will finish to, to give a, a wrap up and kind of create some discussion. So Juan, if you want to start, maybe you can come. Uh, thank you. Is that a, okay, clicker. Huh? Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, asked to give a general presentation on the fair care trust and maybe data management principles. I'm Juan Mazo. I work at uh, CREAF. We have been uh, hearing about all these things for a while, so probably I will be able to tell you something. Surprisingly, the agenda is that. First the first, the fur, then the care, then the trust, then the data management principles, and then a kind of a comparison that we did and some other uh, details. Uh, is this a workshop? I believe it is. So, the fair are very popular, but are, do we know what we are talking about? Uh, sorry, because I'm looking at that because the, the, the slides are there too, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very practical, actually. Uh, so uh, this is a challenge for you. Uh, taking into consideration the, the gopher uh, definition of the, three, of the four letters, give me a couple of words that represent findable. Yeah, so how you will make your data findable? Browser? Okay, browser is a word. Uh, possible. Uh, anything else? Central repository sounds fine to me. Uh, actually, they talk mainly about uh, persistent identifiers and metadata. This is what the, the, the text of the four sub principles you could summarize. I mean, the accessible is easier, I believe. Uh, more or less, we all have an idea of, of accessible. Do you want to try uh, a word that represents accessible? Give me a word. Represents accessible. I don't know. Services, uh, APIs, catalogs. So in the principles talk mainly about open access and protocols, and uh, you can read there the the four sub principles. What intrigues me is the other, the the, the third one, the interoperable. Uh, so what is this interoperability about in the context of fair? Standardization could be, that's a very generic thing. You can standardize in many ways. Say it again. Harm harmonization, yeah. Any other? So if, if, if uh, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to say here. Sometimes people has a preconceived uh, impression on what those four letters represent. But if you go deeper, they only talk about vocabularies. I mean, you read the third two principles, it's everything is about vocabularies. So semantic interoperability only. Uh, and finally, how you make the data reusable from their point of view, do you want to try? They talk about provenance I licenses. Actually, the licenses part so, took me completely by surprise. Uh, it is, it is, Absolutely true, when you think about it, that if you do not have the license, maybe you could not reproduce the, 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 the data. 
So provenance, description of the of the processes plus licenses is what they they are talking about. We might agree with that, but this is this is what is behind. And uh, to me, this is what makes the topic a little bit more complicated than it seems. That we have preconceptions. Data cube. Uh, what is a data cube? Data space. What is a data space? Data space. A space full of data? No. Uh, that, <laughs> that that is the problem. I mean, it seems out to out explainable, but it is not. So that's the exercise with it. Uh, this is very. I I try to break a little bit your perception on what what fair could intuitively mean. There is also the care principles, but those are talking about indigenous data governance. It's a it's a different story and tries to more or less reproduce at least the two first principles in a way that talks about uh, in indigenous sources. So they call about collective benefits in the sense that uh, you need to un enable the indigenous people to actually uh, derive benefit from, from the data. They talk about authority to control. That means that indigenous people has the right and the control of their data in data spaces, I believe this is what they call sovereignty. Uh, you know? uh, the, the, they talk about responsibility. This is uh, that the, the people working on, on indigenous data should uh, explain how they are using the, 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 the data in support of indigenous people. This is how to explain uh, how to use data. It's kind of linked with provenance, maybe. So, so there are some overlaps here and there. Sorry, and uh, and the ethics, uh, the fourth letter. This is about trying to do the the good thing, no? And uh, in general, in the whole life cycle of the data, think about the the rights and the well-being of the indigenous communities. Uh, the trust. The trust is a completely different story. It is not a principle that you will apply, except if you are some kind of a data repository manager, a library manager, or something like that. It is talking to us about how many principles? Uh, you can guess five. Actually, I will say four, and I will tell you why. Uh, the first principle is transparency that in a library means making the library discovery, discoverable. Because when you think about a preservation facility, you think about hard drives full of data closed in cupboards or whatever, no, in, in, in big rooms. And this is not the objective of the library. The objective of the library is to store that, but put it, uh, put it again at the, uh, you know, services of the, user, so discoverability. Uh, the responsibility means that you need to, uh, of course, preserve the, the data. And these in digital terms uh, means to, to care for the integrity of the, of the data. User focus, exactly again uh, about the transparency stuff, no? Is uh, think about your, uh, the expectation of your users first. And sustainability, that means, I mean, preservation is preservation for a lot of time. It's not uh, preserving for one year. It's preserving maybe for 10 years, 100 years, uh, you name it. So you need to think about the sustainability of your uh, preserves items. The, as I said, the number, the number five to me is not a principle. Technology is a tool, it's not a principle. Uh, so the, the, the last letter gave us a clue on how we could do that in, in, in technical terms. Uh, but I don't think, uh, I don't consider my mobile phone a principle. <laughs> well, my wife believes that my computer is a principle for me, uh, and it's very angry about it, but uh, that's probably, you know. <laughs> uh, let me try and link this with some of the principles that were the, uh, prepared in GEO. And uh, I wonder why it says GEOs, the data, man data management principle, because, because it should be GEO. Uh, they are class they are 10, like the, comment the commandments, no? The, the 10 
commitments. Uh, and they are classified in uh, five categories, discoverability, accessibility, usability, preservation, and curation. So let's see what they say. This clicker is very fast. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one, I mean, talks about discoverability. We have talked about discoverability before. Uh, you mentioned, when I say findable, you mentioned catalogs and search engines and browsers. That's exactly what it says. Uh, there is some metadata. I mean, metadata can be classified in uh, several use cases. No, the, the first use case is metadata for discovery. And if you are curious, you can read what is for, for discovery. <laughs> There, are, there is more metadata that uh, allows to document the data for usage and so on. It will appear later. Uh, online access. You can give a download button or you can give a service for access, visualization, or maybe even for analysis. So maybe you don't need to get the data into your premises. You have access by uh, getting some analytical platform uh, in in the other side of the cyberspace, no, and we have been hearing about these data cubes that allow for uh, to do that, the 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 open EO that allows to do that. All these things has been explained here, so they support perfectly this principle. Absolutely, data encoding. I can summarize this data encoding in the right hand side. Uh, don't give me a PDF. Give me some uh, data that is structure that I can I can understand and use from a machine point of view, give me a well-known format, common formats that are used and agreed by the respective community. And the last bullet is about, don't give me a format that is void in semantics. Don't give me a list of numbers. Also explain me why, what those numbers mean, what those columns, which are the variables, which are the units of measures that this uh, columns represent. Uh, as I say, principle number four is data documentation. The metadata comes back, uh, but in a more clear detail. CRSs, the meaning of the data, the number of dimensions, the, sp the space partitioning, etc., etc., etc. Traceability. Uh, uh, traceability is all about lineage, provenance, and reproducibility. So you need to uh, provide. This is again a little bit of metadata, actually. Uh, you need to provide where the sources of your data is, which are the processes applied, which were the parameters that were used in those particular processes, how the processes are chained uh, together in some kind of a workflow, uh, and who were the people involved. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Number six, data quality. Uh, the, of course, you need to uh, accompany the, the data with data quality. This is not very explicit in the first principle. I believe this is a flaw in the first principles. Uh, data quality is really important, and it's not there. And uh, I would like to, to, to emphasize this in particular. Maybe it's a little bit represented in reproducibility, but in a fuzzy way, if you go into the details, you don't find it explicitly. Uh, how to do that? I mean, you can have a report, you can, you can have a specification and say that you're conformant to that. You can have a numeric indicators. I like the, 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 the last one because if you have numeric indicators well documented the meaning, you can compare. And you can compare this data set. It might be uh, better for me because this particular parameter that I'm sensible to that, this is the parameter that satisfies my requirements. And uh, of course, there are several levels of quality. You can specify the quality at the product level, at the, I don't know, the sheet or the individual file level, or even at the observation uh, level. So at pixel by pixel or measure by, by measure. I'm bored. I need some kind of a funny story in between of this, no? This is, this has been so many, uh, so so many, uh, you, you know, principles. Uh, give me something that is a little bit of a fun. Okay, can you believe that uh, in the 60s, the common practice in the BBC was actually to uh, record programs, transmit them, and destroy the record? And that was because at that time, magnetic tapes were re relatively expensive, so they were reused. And by reusing the tape, you will not reuse the data anymore. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course. 
So it seems that uh, this is a popular uh, soup opera that the, the BBC produces. It's called Doctor Who. I'm a particular fan of it. Uh, <laughs> but the, the original episodes, those are 253, it says, 97 were, were completely lost uh, just because there was no record whatsoever. Uh, there were some, you know, you know how this is called, no? Data rescue. There were some, some activities on data rescue and they found in the US uh, some tapes uh, because they ship those tapes in order for this NBC or whatever uh, channel to actually emit them and they were able to rescue them. So this emphasizes how preservation is important and how criteria uh, on what is gonna be present and how changes during time. At that time, uh, repeating a soup opera in, on TV was not invented. So, you know, this thing that it's so common now that you see uh, series of the 60s, 70s, and so on, was not invented there. Things were just transmitted, and that's it. And maybe we have the feeling now that the, uh, with our data, the same thing happens, and might not be the case. So this is the, the interesting bit, I believe, on, on preservation, the criteria we are going to use to actually select what should be long-term preserved. Uh, and uh, we, we have now these uh, solutions for the long tail, the Snodo, the Pangea, and so on. Small actors can use those repositories. Big actors, they have their own uh, preservation mechanisms. The, the number eight is about data and metadata verification. It is, if you are storing things, sometimes they get corrupted. So you need to verify integrity, authenticity, readability, and there are several mechanisms to do that that I will not read now. I hope that the presentations are made available later. Uh, it is not only about reproducing, uh, sorry, about preserving, it's sometimes about reprocessing. And the famous example is, of course, the Landsat series. Uh, they now have recently, well, maybe not recently, but relatively soon uh, in time, or close in time, sorry, they have released this collection too. And this is reprocessing everything from the very beginning. So it's not about integrity, it's about I just have a better algorithm. So I will re-execute it in the whole time series to have homogeneous uh, time, time series, no? Maybe because some popular new formats appear, or maybe that new algorithms also appear. Number 10, can you guess? Which is number 10? <laughs> uh, number 10 is actually the first thing that we mentioned, infer. Do you remember? Uh, persistent identifiers. So number 10 is about persistent identifiers. This is one of the criticisms that I have on the data management principle, they don't match completely with the fair, and I will tell you why. So persistent identifiers, of course, all, we all know what they are. They are useful for citing unambiguously, and if those identifiers have a resolver, and from the identifier you go to the actual data, that's even better. Um, so if you try to match the go fair fair sub principles with the uh, geos data management principle, you get this mess. Uh, <laughs> there are sub principles that doesn't match to anything. And there are things that are very difficult to match. And actually the three of them, no, or, or these, these small round things, those are the data management principles. The square things are the uh, fair sub principles. And I needed to bring the trust back into the picture because if not, three of those principles didn't match with the fair at all. So this was partially uh, my solution and I still have some, some problems to actually creating the whole mapping. Uh, so one of the things that I would like to see in GEO is actually to rethink the data management principles because nobody knows what the data management principles are. Everybody knows what the fair principles are. So we should actually reuse that popularity. Uh, okay, so we did some kind of a studies here in, 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 the, in the project. And uh, one of the things that we were asked is to verify how good we were doing in terms of 
uh, interfere. And uh, this is more or less the result in the rows, you have the first sub principles in the columns, you have first formats, the code, the czar, the parquet, the geojson. You have catalogs, stacks, the nodo, uh, uh, catalog service for the web, and uh, OGC API records. You have downloading service like web feature service, coverage service, uh, APIs for features for coverages. And then you have a little bit of weird things like the semantics in the uh, in the OGC uh, semantic catalog that is called Rainbow these days. Uh, uh, this OGC sensor thing API for in situ data and some encoding, some data models there for, for water and other that could be useful in the project. We are not going in the bad direction, as you see, there are there is a lot of green, but sometimes the things don't match perfectly, could be improved, and there are comments. Now, this, this uh, half means that mm, we can improve there. And uh, this is just for for 12 sub principles, and uh, this slide didn't, didn't allow me to, to have the full table. So that's the last part. Uh, when we go into reusability, we are a little bit white. So that is not so good, but well, uh, there are ways to improve. Finally, let me just tell you that there is this data management principle self-assessing tool. This is something that is in the Geo Knowledge Hub. That if you want to know how good you are doing in on fair and data management principles, you can uh, take it. It's just an Excel file with a set of questions, and you will get some uh, punctuation, some results, some qualification. Uh, thank you. Well, then I think. So, so you said that there was a um, mismatch between a data management plan and FAIR, and that FAIR mm -hmm. data should kind of lead in the geo, uh, the new data management plan. So, and how would you go about doing something like that? Um, yeah, well, the, it is not easy because, oh, I mean, the data management principles are relatively known and old. And consolidated in geo so actually do this change uh, is not a thing that you that you do in a week uh, but i believe we need to start the, the discussion because if not we are as a geo community we are closed in our own environment but everybody else is using other criteria so that that's not a not a good thing so uh, i will say that uh, starting by this uh, mapping that uh, I produce, the first thing we need to do is to actually resolve the principles. And this is kind of a weird because the the commandment number number five, uh, don't kill, uh, will become commandment number three. <laughs> <laughs> and then all our religion pieces will, will go away. <laughs> but 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 this is necessary, I believe, uh, because if not, you know, the things don't match and, and we need to, to talk the, the language that, that everybody in, in data science is currently doing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joan. We all need to learn a lot uh, about these principles in this project, so I think this already begins to go in that direction. You had this table uh, before, yep. and, and you were doing this review between different platforms, if I understand correctly, and different principles. Did you do that for the for the project, like for the like how the project is doing, or or just like in a general way? Uh, both. Uh, uh, we we selected. Uh, I mean, if you remember, we selected in columns what the project is actually using. So if I was in another project, uh, the cog, the czar, the parquet, uh, those will not be in the first place. But you know, in in this project in particular. The, the, the Cloud Optima GOT, the, the ZAR and the Parquet, all these um, formats that are classified or, or structured in tiles and 
chunks and so on, they are very popular here because they want to do these super big <laughs> maps, so you need to uh, tile your 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 stuff. Uh, so that's why uh, those are those are here, and the same for for the rest. And the, the more you go there, maybe the, the the less important are for the for the project. But but yes, the columns were definitely uh, selected based on the on what we know about the formats and services we are going to use or we are we are starting to use in the project. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a, I would like to ask an opinion. I don't know if if you have an answer for that. Um, here I'm from in this institution. We started this so support action organized by the Fair Impact Project, and it's about uh, they're teaching us these um, technologies, the Fair signposting technique and uh, RO crates, and uh, yeah, how to yeah create fair digital objects. So I wanted we were. Trying to understand because some of the colleagues of mine told me well, what, what this is for, etc. So I said, in my opinion, these technologies, I mean, at least the concept of fair digital objects are here to stay. And, and to my op opinion, also like signposting, it, it looks like it's like such a simple technique to. So do, do you also think that uh, these technologies are going to be permanent in the future or? What's your feeling about it? Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, uh, let 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 me get the the crystal ball and, and ask. But if I if I had to say something about what what you said, I mean, I'm a little bit worried about this idea of objects and packages. Uh, on one hand, I understand that the how it's called the Docker approach, for instance, is very good for reuse. I really understand that. But since we are we live in a dynamic world uh, and we are dealing with geospatial, uh, you know, having a big data set and consider that an object, and then a particular user taking a part of it, this generates problems. We also have dynamic data sets you know, that are continue con continuously updated, like the citizen science, uh, that every every second they are producing a new biodiversity occurrence observation. Uh, so this is not really an object. This is something that is dynamic, so connected to to dynamic services that are used to uh, to 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 access and and increase the number of data. So yeah, there are things that you can encapsulate in objects. We have these methods clear for those. Uh, for the things that are more dynamic, we need to think about. Sometimes we use the same approach. We create this frozen uh, moment. This is, becomes an object, and then the, the, the data set continues evolving. Uh, so well, this is what your question suggests. <laughs> uh, Juan, uh, I mean, I suppose that we are supposed to enter a sort of discussion mode, right? So I like to make some comments. Uh, first of all, thanking you for your presentation, but I would like to, for us to take a look at that uh, table there, which summarizes your work. There's some response here, maybe. Should I turn this off and speak or should, no. <laughs> No, no, that's fine. <laughs> and that there's, uh, yeah, there okay. is some kind of an echo, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's let's look at the uh, the horizontal line. I think we need to to understand a little bit why uh, what is useful, what and what is let's say relevant to the community of EO, and out of what is relevant here, I'm going to argue just provocatively that uh, the most relevant of these protocols is uh, by far stack which is really a protocol uh, I, I think by putting cog and czar there there is cog is a file format it's not a protocol that i can use it's a file format that it's there so uh, of course I will concentrate in jail parquet. I will. I don't think there is enough, um, let's say, maturity there for us to consider. Now, if I say that stack is is important to consider, 
what actually we are saying, and it shows on your screen, uh, on your table very clearly, that OGC is doing a bad job. Now they're trying to catch up by putting stars. But you look at how little WFS, WCS, the features and the coverages and sensors, you know, if let's from half of it, it's uh, uh, OGC and they fail in most of what it's doing. So in a certain sense, uh, we should consider that at least for the project that we're doing that has a finite time and uh, stack becomes the most important thing here. Well, Zenodo is not a protocol in the sense it's a place that I can store the data. So I would argue that then I would then focus on the stack column. And as a user of stack, I would argue that they meet F3. Uh, uh, then F3 is metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. And that is available in stack. Uh, so uh, I would tick F3. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree with you that A2 metadata are accessible even when no data are longer available. That's probably true that they don't uh, accept. Whereas uh, I1 metadata use a format accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation, I would argue yes, including because you may... Uh, or may not be aware of the that stack supports CQL2. So now, uh, well, again, it depends on what you consider a language for knowledge representation. And that's, again, anybody's choice. I would actually go for yes there. Mm -hmm. And metadata use vocabularies that follow fair principles. That's anybody's guess what are vocabularies that follow fair principles. Uh, if I'm going to argue that within the vocabulary that most metadata that we're talking about uh, describe, which is very restricted, Sentinel data, let's set data, Sentinel one and whatever, uh, some of other data sets, I would be generous enough to put a yes there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's borderline. I suppose that you have, this is, you have the R's, right? Yeah. yeah. So where's the next slide for the R's? Okay. So that's metadata richly described with a plurality and accurate of, oh no, the, for, let's look at the other one. Meta includes qualified reference to other metadata. Well, I mean, this I3 is really, really open enough that you can argue that, what is this? Uh, what do you mean? Because if I go to a stack catalog of AWS, I see that they have different catalogs there. They have Sentinel, they have Sentinel-1. And then when you go to Sentinel-1, you open the catalog and see what collections are there. I, I would argue that if I were a stack developer, I'm a developer of an R, R stack uh, uh, software, not I am, my team is, I would argue for yes. And then the R1, I don't see why it is not a yes. Please tell me, because uh, it richly described the plurality and accurate and relevant attributes. I find everything I need to find there. I mean, you could argue that there is something that could be improved and so on. But if you go through the stack catalog, you would then say, well, this is band one and this is the description of band one and so on and so forth. It's there. Mm -hmm. Metadata released in a clear and accessible data usage license. Well, stack is not supposed to do that, but of course you would argue that when you go there, you know, but again, I think the, and they're associated with detailed provenance. It depends, but mostly are. And then, most importantly, R13. Metadata meet domain relevant community standards. And I, 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 then I would agree falsely to a yes there. 
So my reading, perhaps, of Stack as a user of Stack is perhaps more generous in interpretation than you did. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying perhaps as a, as a happy Stack user, I have a more generous uh, uh, view that Stack is the thing because there's no thing else. And the problem is there is nothing else that you can use nowadays to uh, access the catalogs of Earth observation data, which are available on cloud services. That's, I, I, I would argue for this fact. Thank you. Uh, my reply to that, thank you for all these observations. Uh, what, I would, what I would like to say is that what you are proposing as, as a start of the discussion is to actually assess the current status of the stack and how we can interpret or even make a stack better. So we could have a, a, a small discussion paper on that. Uh, are you, uh, for instance, the last one, which are the communities we are dealing with? And if we uh, define well which are the communities, we can then uh, argue if this is a yes or a no. Uh, so that that's a piece of work that we could we could continue in 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 this group, trying to focus on on the stack as as the catalog and uh, trying to discuss how we use the stack as fair as possible. Let me let me put it that way. So yeah, uh, so thank you for those observations. I hope that that uh, you Ima, have captured them because if not, uh, let me let me just just correct one thing uh, on what you say. Uh, when in the column of Coq, I'm considering Coq plus HTTP range as a whole thing. So if you set a Coq in a HTTP range enabled web server, that is everyone these days, you can request fragments of the Coq directly from the client and that replaces a protocol. And in that sense, I was thinking about the COG as all, also as as not just as a form of as a protocol. Uh, uh, to me, this is important because it's it's kind of a. I mean, I have been working on on WMS and so on for quite a while. And when I discovered COG, my frustration was, come on, this is working much better, and it's not WMS, and it completely replaced WMS. So actually, it's a protocol. Uh, so this is. The, but this is not because it's cock, it's because it's, it's used with HTTP range as part of it. And I know what I'm talking about because uh, we took these conventions in cock and we put it in an OGC standard that was recently released and I was participating in that activity. So all, uh, all these things are in my mind phrase <laughs> uh, these days. So, so thank you for your suggestions. We will continue uh, with this with this analysis. I believe that's that's very that's very important. Okay, great, great, great discussion. I mean, we have some other presentations, so maybe we move forward for those. But I think these points are worthwhile discussing. So it'd be nice maybe to continue after the. The, the my presentation actually in the Katia's. <laughs> okay, so maybe. Yeah, yes. I will be behind. Okay. So my name is Nuno and I'm working in GFZ. And part of uh, the Open Earth Monitor uh, is very connected with FAIR data and, and FAIR software, right? And one of the working groups is actually focused on this type of uh, tasks. And just to give kind of a catch up, I don't know how much people know, but this is the more or less the, the main ideas of Open Earth Monitor, right? To come up with solutions that serve here, that serve concrete goals and to have a focus on fair platforms and to identify users. Okay. So from here, wait, it doesn't change. Stop changing. I don't know. Ah, okay, sorry, <laughs> it's not it's working. Okay, uh, so, so what happens is we have a, a work part, part of our 
uh, people working in the project are actually focused on on helping in fair usage driven uh, systems uh, and we work with the multiple packages to try to bring them you know some fair principles into their work and include fair 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 approaches in their software development and the approach used on developing solutions in open earth monitor is based on use cases and i've seen a lot of these use cases being presented during this conference um so in two two ways we went about to try to get an overview of fair data was to first make a big survey that we invite our network and then we we use the use case interviews where we are discussing the requirements of each of these use cases to bring some fair questions as well. And this is what we're going to bring bring uh, bring uh, in this presentation. And the idea today, of course, I already said, just show the results and of our tasks and then have some discussion. Okay, so ah, sorry, yeah, this actually doesn't work well. <laughs> it's a bit, it's a bit either fast or too slow. <laughs> Okay, so so just to give an idea of our respondents, most of people came from Germany. You can still, the survey is still online, so you can go there and answer. We had a good overview of different fields of people that responded our broad survey. So this is something we sent to our networks by email, by message, by Twitter, right? We have a big bias in terms of responses. Most are uh, users and most are male. So that's that's something we always tend to find in these surveys, which is a bit disappointing, but uh, it's what we got. Um, and then, uh, just to give you an idea of the results, so in terms of uh, geospatial data that people are using or working with or producing, users are working with remote sensing data and derived products and also in situ data while producers also remote sensing, but not so much with in situ, obviously. There's also a bit of a mismatch of scale. So lots of the producers work with global data sets so they serve global solutions, while the, the users are mostly focused on local, more local areas. And this, I think, is something that goes around remote sensing, right? You have these big data products for the entire world and people are trying to solve local problems, right? And uh, this is something we observed in our survey as well. Uh, we asked them about feature, important features of data. These are all questions that relate with fair principles. So that's the intentional, right? To try to bring their, their perception from there. And we see that the main point is data being findable and data being open. Open is not a fair principle, but it's, it's uh, one of the questions. Uh, and then we find that licensing and, and uh, metadata, those informations are important. So people understand what data they have in their hand in the, and they can find it. So to, to be able to know where the library is, like the example of one, and then to find the book that you want to buy, right? That's the idea here. Uh, wait, uh, wait, yes, problematic features. So these are features that are problems that you have in your data. And, and again, here in this case, we mixed all the producers and users. So that's important to say. Uh, but because the responses are same, similar, and the main the main issues are obviously data not being open. That's something they said was important before, and to have incomplete information. Uh, but not being the right formats was also something that appeared to be. So this is a discussion even connects with the cog and the stack and uh, all those things. So all these data formats not being exactly as people need to use them. So that's an important thing that thing people users found problematic. And then an interesting thing, this for us, for me at least was a bit surprising because what we found is our users, so people are just using data only from the internet, they are much more unaware of what is fair data and, and, uh, and the familiarity with fair data, or if they, even if they used fair data, while producers are much more aware of this. It does make sense after I see the graphic because you know if you're a producer of data, you are worried about licensing. So you are looking around to see what how can I license and what you probably will come across fair principles. But you but users on the other hand might just download from a website, you know, world clean data set, and they don't know about license, they don't know if it's fair or not. So it's an interesting uh, difference here. And this translates also to the barriers. So I think most users say we don't know which data is fair. We don't know, we think the lack of knowledge of what is fair and the benefits is the most important things. And I, do, I don't know, they, they even have a big portion saying, I don't know what is, uh, uh, how to respond to this question. Lack of resources and missing incentives on the other side are the most important for producers. Again, all these efforts to catalog data, put data outside and store data, this requires extra costs, which might be 
most likely what they consider to be a barrier to make the, the data open. It not necessarily is a benefit for their own process. Um, and just to give a catch up of this section, so we have a big bias in our data set, mostly from Germany because I we were doing it from Germany, right? Uh, and also male and, and uh, 7% are mostly just users. We find that there are some different expectations in terms of data. So producers are producing big global data sets. Users want local solutions or local or more regional solutions. Data being findable and open is and well documented is the most important thing. And then the barriers are lack of knowledge for the users and lack of resources and incentives for the producers. And this is maybe an opportunity. So in one sense, we can contribute to fight the lack of knowledge and awareness. And in other ways, there are opportunities to make make it cheaper, maybe, or make it reduce the cost of entry for your fair data in a, in a company. That could be a, an opportunity in the future. Uh, regarding the interview, so this is an opportunistic situation. So we have all these partners working with us in the OMC project, and we have 32 basic use cases or main use cases that are being used to lead the development. We did this, you have multiple stakeholders, and we had interviews with them, or most of them, to try to collect, you know, what are the user requirements in terms of data? And also we put some fair questions and we see this kind of, some of these participations uh, that are working with us. Um, okay, so in this case, what we see is that for, for example, research sector, so we divided them into four groups, broader groups. So research sector, basically, for example, joint research center, uh, private sector will be companies, NGO will be, maybe like WRI and IGO will be the UN, for example. We have lots of partnerships with the UN, so those are participating here. And see like the research sector, there's a big, very important on reusability, reproducibility and accessible. So this, I wonder if this is a bit related with, you know, increasing efforts in terms of, uh, of having to put your data online and having to put your software online and make sure that it's reproducible, right? Then in terms of uh, the private sector, they, they identify that the data just needs to be easy to find. This, uh, this is the, the, the main important thing. They need to know where it is and they will develop maybe their own solutions to, to get to it. And in terms of NGOs, we see that often NGOs, and I think also intergovernmental organizations, what happens is they have their own processes established for big measurements. So for example, if you are doing land degradation, you have some uh, like trends.earth, for example, you have to do your analysis. You can do your analysis there. You have to submit to a specific format. So you might have specific processes now. So you, you actually want data just to link into what you already have more than anything else. And I think that's my interpretation. But of course, I didn't ask why. Uh, but we see that for these big organizations, everything in fair data for them is extremely important in general. Um, and then in terms of barriers, we find more or less the same uh, patterns between all of them. Uh, lack of knowledge and the benefits and, and lack of awareness is the main, the main one of the main components. And then, um, yeah, that's the main points that are, and guidelines as well. So basically everybody's facing similar challenges within our stakeholders regarding fair data, you know, to, to which, what are the benefits? How do I make it fairer? And, and let's go from there. Okay, so we, okay. So just to give an overview of how we from our interviews. So we see that this is just an opportunity questionnaire. It's not a big data set where we can make, you know, big analysis, but it's just more to give an overview. Accessibility, reproducibility, and usability in terms of research, findability for the private sector, and in terms of these bigger organizations, big intergovernmental organizations, fair principles are important, integration, entrepreneurability also very important. Uh, so these are questions that maybe are driving these requirements. And thank you for listening. So mine is a bit smaller. <laughs> okay. So if you have questions, Any questions? yes. Okay. Well, that's very nice, Nuno. No. Uh, I think it's uh, very interesting points you make, and and perhaps uh, a question is that what can we sort of recommend for the OMEMC because we have a, a, a large number of stakeholders. In general, if you look at the most disturbing 
but to me, not necessarily a surprising result was that most of the researchers hadn't got a clue about FAIR. They had no idea about it. And this matches with uh, experience of, if you, let me tell you one experience I was invited as a keynote speaker to IGARS in 2019, I think. And that was in, in, in Japan, Tokyo. And I had plenty of time because I was there for a week and it was very hot. I just stayed at the hotel. So I had nothing to do. And I was looking at all each one of 1,300 papers uh, that were published. And I was looking at each paper and finding out if they had shared the data, shared the results in a reproducible way. And out of the 1,300 papers, uh, generously speaking, I got the fantastic number of 31, which share that data. And then at the dinner, I went to talk to some of the researchers, young researchers, and I say, what do you think? Well, I don't share the data because people are going to steal my ideas. People are going to steal what I do. They're going. And I said, precisely if you share your data and you, and you, and you claim your algorithms, you will retain. It's precisely the opposite that you will retain if you use like Creative Commons or GPL, the right, intellectual property rights are yours and not otherwise because if you don't share someone might still steal your data and you have no way to claim that you were there first now that has to do with the fact that our journals in the area not a single journal has no yes there is one the journal of statistical software out of this whole area, lots of journals, if I can think of, I can think of no other journal where you are obliged to produce your data and your software. So you're not being fair. So the irony here is that the researchers want open data, want fair access data, want everything from the producers where they do not deliver to the downstream, to the readers, the same kind of rights of access that they have and they want to have. So this is like a yellow light that perhaps for you in the project is to enforce to the community of OEMC that be fair to others as others are being fair to you. I mean, it's it's a great point. I've also published uh, papers, and I did one of them was fair, I think, because I did put the software online and the data. But uh, I think it's an extra overhead work that maybe one of the reasons. Julia has a, has a question. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. So I I I absolutely agree. The challenge I see is that at the moment um, in science and in research overall the the incentive to or like the the benefit you get from is by publishing so like it uh, increases your reputation and I think we also have to rethink as a community that um, you should also get benefits and incentives by making your research and workflows reproducible uh, because at the moment it's more the extra mile. So no one taps you on the shoulder, maybe just one, one person on a conference, okay, great. But it's not as like, uh, as a reputation if you make your data and code um, reproducible. And this is the challenge because it is actually a lot to do, right? It's the extra mile. And this is actually not only one day to make things reproducible. Um, if you have a paper, then, yeah, you have to think of maybe making a smaller data set available, then you have to add the documentation and this can easily add up to a week's work. And the question is, okay, do I get um, the enough benefit from it? Um, do people appreciate it um, enough as a scientist? Do I, do I get a, a reputation out of it? And I think we also have to think of ways how to incentivize uh, to 
publishing reproducible workflows. Have a response first. Of a question, like, how would we go about creating those or encouraging those extra incentives? So, I mean, just telling the principal investigators to force their, because they are editors, they might say. open source community has shown us that it's actually possible to stimulate open source without importing open source. Uh, they understood the benefits, the people making money, buying, deploying open source and so on. There are business models behind that. So it's a question maybe of changing the culture, the scientific community. I mean, of course, if we enforce that, we'll get immediate results. Uh, I'm, I'm not denying that, but I would rather prefer to try and to, to try and change the, the culture in general. I have a question. My question was related to your comment. Uh, I saw a point uh, on the slides that said fair data is not necessarily open data. That poses a problem. And in my experience, is there then, my question is, is there, uh, will there be some kind of compliance mechanism that covers the non-open data and, 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 and certifies it, say, as, as being fair? Because I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I published uh, an open data, an open access article. Um, and one of the concerns I had as one of the authors was, that I know there are private enterprises that will take that data, create a slightly modified derivative and lock it down and charge an exorbitant fee for it. It goes against the principles of my, uh, and, and perhaps not even credit to me and the other authors. Would they then be able to charge for it, but claim fair data because I, as the original author had uh, published it under fair principles. This is going to bring a lot of discussion. So let's see. <laughs> let's see. Two, two. Yeah. I mean, just answer that one. It depends on the license. So if I do a CC, uh, non CC, no, CC non commercial by attribution. Yeah. And then the, you can basically send a cease or disease letter to the guy and say, come on, you're, you're a criminal. No, a, c a criminal uh, as defined by someone who breaks the law. And, and essentially, you have to be careful to choose the license. You So if you see do a CC by attribution, uh, non-commercial, that's it. And, or, uh, or the alternative for software would be uh, GPL, uh, GPL2 or GPL3, where basically, I mean, the guy can try and they will do it. But again, it is, he will be, I mean, he will be advised, unless he's a Trump who thinks that can he do anything, but normal, normal, normal companies are nowadays very, very careful about reputational costs. And the reputational cost of being a criminal and breaking the law by revoking a license that you have done uh, and you have claims to it because it's registered on the node or in any other site uh, is enforceable. Is enforceable. 
And it's enough that people get aware of that. So you should never publish your data without a proper thinking of what license you would attach to it. And then at that moment, you claim intellectual property rights and the guy who uses your data is obliged to follow the license you put. I agree. One, one final add-on to that. Now, change in culture. The journals, there are some journals that object to the use of these uh, add-on clauses to the CC license, for example. They can consider them very restrictive. Uh, the the non-commercial one. And I, I personally had a discussion with one such leading journal and I, I rationalized and explained and they let me publish, let us publish our, our article under the non-commercial license. But it, it's a challenge. And now again, we feel pressure to remove the non-commercial, but we are aware of companies just watching like hawks. <laughs> Not from those companies, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think these legal, I, I mean, these legal, when it becomes very complex, it's really not my field, but, but I think it's one of the risks, of course, right? Of publish, but that happened before. But I think something you better said earlier is like, if indeed you are putting licenses in your software and in your, in your data, then basically we are putting a legal, like a legal window that protects you, right? If I put code now in my GitHub without any license, it can be copied by anybody else, right? Uh, uh, I, you, we have entered into the, the, the data, data space arena again, and I would like just to clarify something. We need to focus who is the enemy here. Uh, yeah, so we have two levels here. On one hand, we have closed data data that you will not access because you don't even know exist. And even if you ask, you will be denied. This is mine. Another th thing is data that is shareable. So it's offered against some kind of compensation. Uh, I believe that those two needs to be really separated. And, and of course, at the very bottom, we have open data uh, and party. Uh, <laughs> but but you, you know what I mean, no? I understand the scientific community has its restrictions in funding, so it's better that we do open science and so on. But we need to focus on what is really the problem here. The To me, the main problem is there are some data sets that are sitting on some kind of obscure places and it's better that we have them available, even if we need to, you know, pay for some cost. No, I just have a comment related to the forcing people to publish uh, data, software, and something. Actually, we are we have now a, a big problem related to the publication. Publication system is completely broken. If you want to publish, everybody can publish. And uh, reviewers are exhausted, editors too. And so actually, the system actually is not really working. And if you publish something, basically nobody will read what you do. The only way to make it, uh, so it's a problem for one side, but on the other side, it's an opportunity because if you want that your uh, study, paper, data, whatever you do is seen from somebody, you have to make all these kind of things. So we are not going to force people um, with constraint from June or whatever, but I can imagine then um, that before or later, at least in this field, in earth science, it's um, mostly something that will happen by in, without doing anything. Because actually, if you want to make somebody using your data, you have to publish. Uh, you have to, if you want to make somebody reading your paper, you have to make it reusable. Otherwise, otherwise it's... Uh, so I don't think it's... Or before or later, the things will change uh, without any constraint. I don't know. That's my understanding. I, I don't know. For, for for me, the conversation. The only thing I see is a, a researcher. Is you know, I see people who go to study biology at the university, and they maybe do a PhD in biology, and they have to become programmers, and now they also have to become understand licensing and understand. You know, it becomes a lot of skills for. You know, a single person to be able to to work in science is becoming more and more 
complicated, I would say. So if there's a side to it that I think, you know, at, at some point we should be able to delegate this, this type of decisions. No, I'm not sure within our organization or to the journals, you know, because otherwise a researcher will have to be everything and nothing at once, right? So that's a comment I make to the conversation. Well, uh, let me just go back a little bit and try to answer Jose's point. Jose, one point, one. I think the way I see this task, this is my view, not necessarily the management's view, is that the focus should be on the project itself. So what I would imagine that you could do as task leader or the task leaders is to go through the various projects, various case studies, and which are being delivered or will be delivered as part of OEMC. Now, for each case study, you need to assert that if the, is the data fair, is the data open source, is it available? My point here is that if you come up with a project for the European Commission and you promise openness, open earth monitor. And part of your, I haven't looked at the life, so I have no, no idea whether everybody is playing fair and everybody is complying with the license. But the project itself, when it was sold to the commission, was sold in the assumption that data would be made available, software would be made available, and things would be reproducible. So I would focus on what the project is supposed to deliver and look step by step at what are each components to make, I mean, it may have a case where there's a good reason why the data is not open perhaps, or perhaps it belongs to uh, someone else before, or the software is inherited from someone, fair enough. But at least I hope that someone in your task would come up with a list of recommendations. I can help you because I'm hired to, to do this as a consultant, but to find out uh, whether Open Geo Hub and the project team runs a reputational cost by promise something and not delivering what it promises. And this is not our enemy our, ourselves, just to not enemy. We should concentrate upon ourselves because we can change ourselves because people who sign to the project are bound to certain rules. So at least within the constraints of the project, we need some guidance and I hope your task will provide that guidance to the rest of the teams. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so I think maybe we should cut your, you, we should move to your presentation, right? Uh, unless anybody that didn't speak yet wants to say something just to increase the feed input. I guess not. So, uh, Katia. Yes, this is perfect. Actually, it leads very nicely to the third part of the workshop. I will not present. I am here to learn, actually. I am not at all an expert in that I'm learning a lot. Uh, but uh, the, we wanted to make this last part of the workshop exactly what has already begun, and I thank uh, Gilberto and Joan for their comments in this direction. Of yes, we there are many challenges in terms of uh, open data and fair data and so on, uh, but we need to focus on our projects and how do we do that? So uh, this discussion will not be exhaustive today, but uh, we take the homework of thinking we have six years to make it happen to make this small change in our project happen of having our use cases actually be better in this direction. So um, no surprise, I think there is a big problem of lack of knowledge that's uh, already established and that should change. Uh, how do we do it? We were talking about maybe some internal workshops paid by the project to all uh, the, the consortium so that we, we begin to, to to be a little bit experts. We're never going to be experts, as Nuno said, but we do need to, to, to do that small step for our user cases wherever we are, right? To, to gain a little bit more knowledge. 
Most importantly, as has already been highlighted, uh, this is not a matter of, of uh, it will be nice. Uh, the, the call itself has a component of, uh, let's remember, remember, the objective of the call was to enhance the fairness of environmental observation data. It's an objective of the call. We applied for the project, we got it. So hopefully <laughs> the European Union, as part of the evaluation, will take these criteria into consideration of whether the project actually achieved its objectives. So uh, I would say that we actually need to do this. It, it's really not uh, an option. Uh, the idea was to start the discussion on how we can do it. Uh, so uh, I make the commercial of World, World Work Package 8. Uh, Beatriz, uh, Diego, and, and me, and Lea are part of this work package of communication. Uh, we can have uh, many uh, activities done, but uh, I think it's best that we try to um, coordinate. So for example, uh, uh, we were talking about uh, scientists learning about fair, uh, fair data, that's important. But how then can we use our communication tools to help us learn about this communication data? We have a glossary campaign. Uh, we want to use this opportunity of the glossary campaign in our project to have uh, uh, more uh, information around. We have already two uh, uh, concepts of fair data and open data. So I will contact you guys directly on what do you think could be the definitions in these concepts that are like basic enough for the construction to know which other concepts should be there? And this is like the internal campaign that we can manage. Um, and I think from what Nuno was presenting, and we in YASA were also responsible for uh, the, the, the same interviews. At least one panorama in my mind is, is that Unfortunately, we are not a very homogeneous project, right? We have objectives, we have uh, uh, use cases, but the use cases might be in different um, levels, let's say, of, of uh, using fair data and of uh, having uh, accessible uh, data sets, right? So then how do we do it? I don't think it's a simple challenge. It's, it, it can be a, a little bit complex in the sense of, uh, we need to, to see where we are use cases and then see how we can advance a little bit. So I wanted to see how many of, of you guys here are actually representing use cases. So you can raise your hands. So there's one, there's two. This is a slide, a nice product of the communication <laughs> uh, work package team. It was actually meant to be in the poster, but I think it's a good idea to, to make them available because it, there's, there's really nice, Yes. 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 This is not a final, actually. The category changed because this was a, a, a former version. So the call is for the work package. So our colleagues can take notes of socializing these nice, wonderful designs that, <laughs> that you guys made. Yes, I take that note. So the whole point is um, exactly. So we, uh, as a deliverable for the project, started with this survey. And this gave us an overview. I think the next step could be of, of each of the use cases having this, uh, based on this overview, based on these questions, with all the help of our experts, this baseline of where our use cases are in terms of whatever uh, uh, format we, we decide to use as a project. And then how are we going to ad advance that extra mile that Julia was talking about, no? In a very, very realistic and practical way. And uh, this goes with the idea of um, impact. Ah, sorry, this was another categorization, uh, talking about the categorization that we also need to think about, but most importantly of the impact. So the European Union will expect some measure of impact and that's what we're working on. So please let us know your thoughts on this. Um, based on the survey, we categorized just by looking at the responses that you gave us uh, into how can we think of different types of impact and you can see, I will just read them uh, one by one. Uh, one could be tool and data creation, improving data and information, data processing, impact policy, that, that it could have an, a direct impact on policy, improving stakeholder tools. And I think that's pretty much, or no second impact type. There's uh, first impacts, there's second impacts. These are for all the use cases, and you can see this, there's heterogeneity, no? This was a very, very fast exercise, but the whole point about this is that, not surprisingly, a lot of our impact as a project is going to have to deal with data in a very, very differentiated way. So then 
the call that we do for, for you guys as use cases in the next uh, months, we will uh, send a mail eventually when the next deliverable will, will be, is to how we can think of this impact, where we are now, how can we improve a little bit, and what do we need, what resources do we need of the project to make that happen? Uh, so that our impact can be, even if heterogeneous, still measurable and uh, significant. As part of our deliverable, we have a similar table uh, that Joanne presented uh, in detail of uh, for each, I, yeah, again, for each use case, uh, what uh, different measures we collected uh, in the deliverable, and one of them has to do uh, as as Nuno presented related to data. That could be already a measure of our baseline. We we can we can think about it, or we can improve it a little bit. So where the projects are, and then have a, a later table uh, on how that changed. And just to close the, uh, the presentation that is meant to, to have this discussion, we can have this discussion now or, or, or in the next uh, 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 meetings, is um, that is, it is not really just about heterogeneity of use cases, right? So some use cases may think about opening certain data sets in a, in a different way, but it's also about heterogeneity in the way that we think about data and the impact that this data can have. This presentation yesterday uh, from uh, Anka <laughs> uh, gave me this idea of how we can have a framework to uh, measure this heterogeneity. Uh, for example, she was talking about open data in terms of input and output scientific data, uh, but also about uh, uh, workflows and documentation. Uh, but not just that, right? For example, we, we in YASA focus a lot in the community part of the data. So citizen science, uh, how the maps can be validated. So again, how can we evaluate or how can we measure this heterogeneity that we have as use case studies in a meaningful way that makes sense to the project that can help us uh, uh, quantify and measure this impact that we will have? Okay, so the whole point of my presentation was to give you questions that we can use as a discussion. Uh, the discussion already started, so we're very happy about that. Um, we uh, included a link to a Miro board that uh, we might have uh, today if you want to add more uh, uh, to the discussion or the next days when you go back to use use case studies. But most importantly, this is a commercial also for uh, the these deliverables that we will have, which is uh, uh, the new version of this measuring the impact. You will get we, you will get some surveys about us. And the idea is to work coordinated so that we can uh, try to measure and actually have this impact that the European Union expects from us. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so I want to ask for, ask for questions because I, I was not presenting. Uh, the idea now, uh, we have 10 more minutes if we want to use that for to continue the discussion that was already going on, uh, but it doesn't have to happen. Of course, we can just continue it uh, uh, in the next meetings and months. Can I actually? Give a suggestion because now we were talking and Joan showed this tool that you can measure your fear and that the management principle where you are. So I wonder if it would be cool to go through the stakeholders with that tool and try to fill in and see where, you know, where actually our use case users are in that place. So that could be an interesting approach to see, right? And then maybe from here you identify some places to pinpoint ac fair action. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any other points to discuss. We had a long discussion. I, the idea is to be one hour, but I kind of just let, we both let the discussion happen. I don't know if the people who didn't speak have something to say. I know I have to do this, see if uh, get some extra. Uh, otherwise, nothing. Huh? Okay. Okay. This is the... that, that came to my mind, but maybe it's useful for us. So if it is true that fair is not open, it's just fair. So making your data accessible, I propose this. That by accident is pronounced like this. So it's kind of a nice. Uh, <laughs> so what about we use these offer principles here in this project? Uh, 
Well, it, this is this isn't a silly thing, but uh, what, what I would like to 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 emphasize is that in our data management plans, we will we will definitely separate this open uh, thing from the fur, and uh, of of course, uh, as Gilberto said, there are reasons why data might not be uh, open, but this could be a transitional period only, so we need to find out uh, why. So we, we we will consider now five letters instead of in, instead of uh, four. Yeah, that's all fair. A new a new you after all five uh, names, you got the new one. Okay, that's good. Okay, uh, any more points or questions? Um, does anybody wants to bring because it's coffee break? I guess uh, we can go over for coffee break. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Katy and Juan. And uh, 